Thank you. Ah. Ah. Whoa. Where'd you all come from? <laughs> you know, the best part of school for me ended in the first year of school called kindergarten. Because the best part was, you guessed it, nap time. The title of this morning's sermon, church, is Good Morning, Jesus. How many of you all have noticed that the mornings lately, they've just been nice and cool and crisp? I don't know about you, but it makes it just a little harder to get out of bed in the morning. Because it's just cool out. It's not cold. It's just cool. It's nice. And under the blanket, it's just so warm and cozy. My boy Lincoln this morning kind of exemplified this. He woke up about 10 minutes after 6. And I went in and I laid down and I talked to him. And it wasn't just for a few minutes. He was back asleep. We woke him up. It was almost 8 o'clock. He was just snoozing away. So comfortable because the house was just nice and cool this morning from the outside air. And it was just so warm and cozy underneath of that blanket. Anybody here ever just want to stay in bed? Sometimes. When I was 19 years old, I got a summer job working for Trust Joyce McMillan. And I had stayed up fairly late one night. And I don't really remember doing this. But I woke up, and it was about five minutes before I was already supposed to be at work. And I looked over on my nightstand, and my alarm clock looked just like this. Someone had unplugged it, wrapped the cord neatly around it, and placed it in the center of the stand. And that someone was me. I don't remember having done this, but apparently I wanted to sleep longer. And I was so tired, I just woke up, and it's funny, because I, I literally wrapped the cord real neat around it, tucked it in, and set it down nicely, and went back to sleep. The preacher has a confession. Yes, I did much speeding on the way to work that day. <laughs> much speeding. Do we have any morning people here this morning? Amen? Best part of the day. That's what they tell me anyways. <laughs> Jesus' disciples were morning people. Did you know that? When did they go to the tomb? The sun was just coming up, wasn't it? They headed out while it was still dark, didn't they? They showed up, the sun was just com coming up enough for them to be able to see. My wife used to have the alarm clock that just fit her personality perfectly. This alarm clock was only about this big, and the snooze button was about this big. It's the only alarm clock I've ever seen where the whole top of the thing was one big snooze button. So you could like just slap it, you could throw a shoe at it, whatever you needed to do. And that thing, I could describe it one way, it was loud! I mean, it was just obnoxious and it didn't really seem to have any other volume. It was either you couldn't hear it or it screamed. How many of you all know that God's alarm clock is going off? It is sounding for His church. In Romans 13, 11, it says, And do this, knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For our, now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. It's high time that we wake up. The alarm clock is screaming at us. And we're so cozy. 
We're so comfortable. Everything's just nice. I don't want to get out of bed. And God is asking us this morning, church, when I show up, are you going to be at work or are you going to be asleep on the job? Are you going to have to rush? And is there really time to rush once God is already here? How many of you all dream a lot when you sleep? Do we have any dreamers in the place? I dream. I don't remember hardly any of them. And when I do, they're just dumb. Anybody identify with that? My dreams most of the time are just goofy. You know, I can't really take them seriously. My wife will wake up and tell me these, these, these really detailed, long stories about what she dreamed. And a lot of times, they semi-even make sense. Not mine, hardly ever. If my dream makes sense, it was God. <laughs> a lot of us have dreams. There's some dreamers in the house this morning, some people dreaming about problems in their life being solved. Marriages getting healed. Family situations working out between parents and children. Adults and their exes. All of these things. Financial situations. We have these dreams, don't we? We have this ideal in our mind, don't we? of if these things would work out and what it would look like. And wouldn't that be nice? Amen? Amen, church? Any dreamers in the house? Anybody here today with a dream? Anybody here today with an ideal about healing, about restoration, about forgiveness? Dreamers in the house. God is asking us to wake up because we cannot live the dream as long as we're in bed. God wants us to wake up. That way we will... We'll quit dreaming the dream and begin, listen, living the dream. The only way for the dream to come to pass is for us to wake up and get out of bed. He says our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. How many of you all know that Christ's coming is closer than ever? Amen? Amen. And I believe this. The word salvation means deliverance. I believe that our deliverance is closer than ever. If we will what? Realize it's high time to wake up. Anybody want to wake up and live the dream today, church? Amen? Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Jesus was good friends with a family that lived in a little community called Bethany, shortly outside of Jerusalem. There were two sisters and one brother, Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. And Martha, the sister, comes and finds Jesus. And she tells him, the disciple, the man whom you love, he's sick. Can you come? And Jesus agrees to do so, but he waits a few days. And he decides to head on out. See, the Church, today God is telling us something. The alarm clock's going off because it is time to wake up. See, look what Jesus said in John 11, 11. These things He said, and after He said it to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. The resurrection. I've heard people tell me this, that it's when we die, our soul sleeps. Is the resurrection of the soul or of the body? Remember when Jesus died, it tells us in 1 Peter 3 that He went and preached to the spirits in prison. Jesus wasn't asleep. He was doing things, wasn't He? When you look in the Bible in Luke chapter 16... There's another man named Lazarus. He was very poor. He was a beggar. And he would go to the rich man's house and he would eat the crumbs from his tables. And he had sores on him. And the rich man's dogs would lick his sores. And it says he passed away and then the rich man died. 
And Jesus talked about the rich man being in torment and Lazarus being in paradise. And he begged Abraham, Abraham, just send Lazarus down that he could dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm in torment. They were not asleep. We need to understand that our soul is everlasting. That when we were born, listen everybody, we didn't begin 70 or 80 years, we began eternity. Amen? Lazarus is just asleep. <laughs> but Jesus is going to wake him up. In Ephesians 5.14 it says this, listen everybody, this is a word for us, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. If you're tired of just dreaming the dream, wake up. And His light will shine on you, and He will give you light. Anybody here ready to get out of bed? Tired of hitting the snooze button? Because all we're doing is delaying God's will for our life. Delaying deliverance. Delaying the light shining down in our life. Christ's resurrection, church, tells us this. It's time for the church to wake up. It's time for the church to get out of bed. Anybody here ready to wake up? No, this isn't a normal resurrection sermon. I'm not going to get up here and give you a tree, Tyson. What happened? And then this happened, and this happened. I heard one of those on the radio this morning. It put me to sleep. We've all heard the story, but how does it apply to our life? How does it apply to the here and now? Because the resurrection is about life now. Yes, it's important what happened then, but the reason it's important is because of what it does for us now. And so Jesus said, it says in verse 12, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he sleeps, if Lazarus is just asleep, He'll get well. See, they didn't understand something. Jesus is telling them that he's asleep because he can wake up. Because that sleep represents death for the believer. See, our bodies are going to go to sleep, not our souls. Paul said this, I'm willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But one day that trumpet is going to sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall rise up after him, and we shall meet him in the clouds. And it says, there we shall be with him forever. Hallelujah. When we die, our body just sleeps, because it's going to wake up. This life, listen, isn't all there is. The best is yet to come. I don't know about you, but so often... I'll be so comfortable. And in the morning, it's so calm and it's so, just the temperature is just right and I'm just nice and warm. And I get woken up and I'm awake, but I just want to lay there. Anybody ever just want to just lay in bed for a while? Isn't that just comfortable? Last thing you want to do is get up. You're just so comfortable. Oh, do I have to get up? But see, God isn't calling us to just wake up and lay there and stare at the ceiling. We have to get up. We have to get the warm blanket off and get up. See, number two, church, God is telling us it is high time to get up. Remember the disciples, what do they think Lazarus is doing? They think he's taking a very long nap. They don't understand what Jesus is trying to teach them. And so when you look in John eleven thirteen, 13, it says, However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. They thought he was just taking a nap. So it says in verse 14, Then Jesus said to them plainly, Listen, guys, Lazarus is dead. He's dead. Jesus told them, We have to go see Lazarus. And this is a dangerous journey. The last time Jesus was there, they tried to kill him. The religious leaders hated Jesus, hated his disciples, because he was uprooting the whole religious system. 
And the disciples didn't want to go because they were afraid. But we have to get up. And so because they were scared for their life and trying to protect themselves, and they weren't willing to go, Jesus had to say to them, Look, Lazarus is dead. We have to go. He's not just taking a nap. This is serious. And there are lost people all around us, people who do not know Jesus. And God is asking us to get up out of bed. He's telling us, look, they're dead. You've got to wake them up. This is serious. There's eternity ahead of each one of them. And us ourselves, they're lost and they need the light to wake up. Earlier on, Jesus, one time when he came into Jerusalem, he walked out to a pool of water. It's called the Pool of Bethesda. And there were all kinds of sick people laying there. Blind people, people who were lame, deaf. And the scriptures tell us that sometimes an angel would stir the waters and that people would rush to get into the pool, that they would get healed. And Jesus walks through the crowd to just one man. And he looks down at this man. He's been laying there, listen, 38 years. Do you know how long Israel wandered in the wilderness? They were in the wilderness for 40, but the scriptures tell us they wandered for 38. Did you know that? He's been lying there watching people get in the pool and get healed for 38 years. And Jesus looks at him and he asks him a question. Do you wish to be well? That may sound like a silly question. Well, of course I want to get healed. Why do you think I've been here all this time? He, he began to make an excuse, though. And it seems reasonable. He said, but look, every single time the angel stirs the waters, those who are a little better off than I am get in there before me. I never get my chance. My chance always gets <laughs> taken by someone else. And maybe in life you feel that way. You feel like all the opportunities go to someone else. You watch other people get healed. You watch other people with this perfect little family. You watch other people with what seems like this perfect marriage. People even act like some churches are perfect. All you got to do is go there. You know it won't be anymore. And we allow that to discourage us, don't we? Because we can see what everybody else has and what they're getting. And the message is, that's not for you. That's not for me. I can't have that because they're getting it. And surely they can't have a piece of the pie in me too, right? That's what the enemy's saying, isn't it? And I want you to notice what Jesus said to this man. In verse 8 of John chapter 5, it says, Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And it says that once the man was cured and picked up his mat and walked. I want you to notice something. Does it say he was healed, then he got up? What does it say? It says, at once the man was cured. After he did what? He got up. See, we're so busy fixing our eyes on the problems. We're so busy fixing our eyes on what other people have and what we don't have instead of looking to our God. He looked at Jesus and he heard the words of Jesus and he got his eyes off of his problems, off of his sickness, off of his worries, and off of everyone else. And when Jesus said, get up, and he forgot about all those things and he remembered who his God was, he was able to get up and he was cured and he took up his mat. And he left that place. Amen? See, it's time that we get our eyes off of our problems, get our eyes off of everyone else, and get up. Quit making excuses. 
Somebody else being blessed doesn't mean you can't be blessed. It means God will do it for you too because He's no respecter of persons. What He's willing to do for someone else, He's willing to do for you. We have become the nation that says, oh, it's not my fault, it's daddy's fault, it's mama's fault, it's grandpa's fault. Hallelujah. Just look to the Lord and quit blaming people. Amen. 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 We've all had our problems. You're not alone. We've all been defeated. We've all been down. But Jesus is saying, get up. Get up off your feet. Get some bounce back in your step. It's time to wake up, and it's time to get up and quit just laying there. Hallelujah. I remember when I was in school, we went to Marshall, and we had our orientation. And we sat down with these people, and they said, look to the person to your right, to your left, in front of you, and behind you. They said, three out of four of you will never graduate. Three out of the four people that you just looked at will not be here in four years. And I saw why very shortly. I remember my first year of school walking out of my dorm room, and there was a guy standing there. It was late in the evening. And he had been in his room all day. And what he had been doing, now this isn't this important, he had spent the entire day in bed watching the entire Planet of the Apes trilogy. I can't think of any greater waste of time. I've seen one of them, and what a waste of time. All day? Really? He was one of the people I didn't see on graduation day, by the way. He never made it there. See, he woke up that day. He even got up, but he never left the room. God is calling us to wake up and get up and number three, he's telling us it's time to come out. It's time to get out of our room. It's time to get out of our comfort zone. It's time to get out of our little realm of safety and get out in the real world, amen? You're not going to get anywhere in your room, in your comfort zone. Coming back here to John 11. As Jesus approached Bethany, the lady who had come to her a few days earlier, Martha, shows, sees him coming. She runs to him. Lord, if you'd been here, Lazarus would have never died. If you had just come quick, you could have healed him. Nevertheless, I know that the Lord will do whatever you say. And then Mary comes, says the same thing. Lord, if you'd been here, Lazarus would have never died. And the scriptures tell us the shortest verse in the Bible that Jesus wept. The enemy's telling us God doesn't care. I'm here to tell you that He does. He touches His heart when we suffer, He cares about every problem we face. He loves us so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die in our place. Amen. He loves us. God cares deeply. And so he walks up to the tomb where Lazarus is. And he tells them to pull back the stone. In John 11, verse 41, it says, So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. It's a graveyard, and one man noted that if he hadn't have named Lazarus personally, the whole place would have risen. And I think that's an interesting commentary. But honestly, I don't know that that's why he said Lazarus. You know why he said Lazarus? It's because he knows us all by name. Because our God is personal and intimate and desires a real relationship with each of us one-on-one. -on -one. He knows your name and He cares about you personally. You're not just a number. You're not just another one in the crowd. You are particular and special to Him. 
I don't know about you this morning, but I did a little bit before I came here. My teeth were gross. Y'all, can't stand myself. My clothes were wrinkly and they didn't smell quite right. And so I don't know about you, and if you came different, that's okay. You're so welcome. But I took a shower, and I brushed my teeth, and I combed my hair, and I put on nicer clothes. Lazarus has been dead for four days, and Jesus is telling him to come on out. I don't know about you, but I'd say the odor is not appealing. My odor isn't appealing after eight hours in bed. Listen, he's been dead four days in the hot Mediterranean climate, locked up in a room with a stone. There's no ventilation. And Jesus is saying, come out. And maybe sometimes we don't want to come out because we know what we look like. We know how much of a mess we are. We know all of our mistakes. We know all of our struggles. I'm not going out there. Lord, have you smelled my teeth? I can't go out today. It's just too hard. And the enemy's trying to keep us in our room, isn't he? He's trying to keep us from coming out. It says in verse 44, The dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. He's in these grave clothes. He looks like a mummy. It's literally what he looks like. He's been wrapped up in linen cloth, around and around and around. The cloth was even around his face. And Jesus said to them, that's his disciples, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Can you bring my shoes, please? I want you to notice something. I asked my brother to do something here. Did he tell Lazarus, take off all your clothes? Who did he tell to take the linens off? The disciples, amen? Listen, when you, any of y'all ever, ever, ever had children? Gee whiz, where'd y'all come from? Anybody here ever had children? Did any of them dress themselves the first day they were born? How about somebody that's been sick in a hospital bed for a long time? They need somebody to take care of them, don't they? Lazarus is in no condition to take the linens off. So who's it going to have to be? The disciples. Come here, brother. I know this is uncomfortable. <laughs> Lazarus comes out. He's willing to come out even though his teeth stink, his clothes stink. Yes, even these. Oh my God. Amen. I notice one thing here, though. It doesn't say, thank you. It doesn't say that they had to dress him. But the scriptures tell us this as Christians. To put off the old person we used to be. To take off that old sinner, and put on the new man. See, the disciples have come. They followed Jesus. They didn't want to wake up. They didn't want to get up. They did not want to go get Lazarus out. But he's out. Because God is telling us that it's high time to wake up. And for Christians, that we need to put away our sleeping clothes. We don't need any pajama boys in the army of God. We don't need any basement warriors who never see the sunlight. We need to get out there and be the men and women of God. Amen? Amen. See, what's going to happen is this. <laughs> when Jesus was resurrected and the ladies went into the tomb, you know what they found? They found the grave clothes, what? Neatly folded and placed. Because Jesus was sinless. And he was able to take off that junk. But how many of y'all know that we have our junk, don't we? 
We have our garbage. We're not perfect like Him. Jesus was perfect, spotless Lamb of God who could die in our place. And when He was resurrected, those grave clothes meant nothing. He peeled them off because He was sinless, spotless, perfect. Amen, church? Jesus needed no help. But I thank God we need and have help. And that's our brothers and sisters. Listen, that's why we need one another. We have entered a generation of people who say, I don't have to be a, 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 to be a Christian. I don't have to go to church. Listen, you're not going to do anybody any good sitting in your grave clothes in your house. It's time to get out because we need each other. I'm not perfect, but with you all helping me, we can work together and get these old stinky grave clothes off. Amen? Because this is what the Word says in John chapter 9, verse 4. Jesus said this, I must work the works of Him who sent me. Please listen, church. While it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. Church, this morning, it's time for the people of God to get off the pajamas, the grave clothes, and get dressed for work. And in case you don't think I'm serious... Let's look ready for work, amen? Anybody here ready to join God's army? Ready to get up out of bed? Willing to let someone else give you a helping hand? Because coming out means this, I'm willing to show the world I'm not perfect. I'm willing to come out here and say, yes, I needed a shower this morning. And my clothes are old and they stink. I need help. Can you help me? Amen, church. It's time that we quit dreaming the dream and start living it. It's time, church, that we wake up. And we don't just lay there. We decide to get up out from underneath the covers, out of our comfort zone, and then look at the door and say, yes, I'm not perfect, but I'm getting out of here. Because I'm not perfect, but I'm getting better. I'm not going to lie here feeling sorry for myself, feeling defeated. I'm not going to just dream my dreams. I'm going to begin to live my dreams. My dream of my family being restored. Amen. My dream of my family members getting saved. Amen. My dream of me being delivered from addiction to drugs, to alcohol, to various things. My dream to see my children and my grandchildren delivered from addiction to drugs and alcohol. And I know that I've got to get up because if I don't get up, how will they know? How would Lazarus have ever gotten up if the disciples didn't get up and go? They had to be there. Yes, Jesus does the saving of the fish, but then He uses us to clean the fish up. Amen? He's the ultimate fisher of men. But hallelujah, He uses the church to get our lives on course, doesn't He? He uses the church to bring deliverance and strength and fellowship that we need. Amen. God is wanting to bring revival to all communities. Hallelujah. One last scripture, Isaiah 60 verse 1. They've said that the best part of waking up is folders in your cup. I found it to be Jesus in my heart. Amen. God says this, arise, shine. Anybody ever had somebody tell you, rise and shine? Well, the first one to say that, by the way, was God. He says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon who? You. Everyone, please stand this morning. Let us arise. I want to ask the worship team to come forward. Jesus told His disciples, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be what? Hid. Church, we need to rise and do what? Shine. The church needs to wake up. Get out of bed. Quit hitting the snooze button on God. And say, God, I thank you, Lord, that your light has risen upon me. Not just on my neighbor. 
that you are no respecter of persons and that the dream you've placed in my heart, you say you will bring to pass. Amen, church. Church, I pray right now, these altars are open today for anyone who wants to rise and shine.